So the Sunday after our children's summer camp uh, every year, I've been doing an art sermon. It's something I don't normally do, but I do it uh, once a year. Um, so at this time, if, if you're a child and would like to see a little closer, feel free to come and sit on the floor here uh, at the front. Um, so children, you're welcome to come and sit here if you want to see a little closer, but stay off the steps, okay? <laughs> uh, this is your chance. Come on down. Don't be shy. Okay. So don't mind me. I'm going to be doing stuff here while I'm talking. Um, Several years ago, I had a, a rough few years of my life. It was shortly after coming out of college. Um, I had finished college. I had just gotten married. We were kind of making our way in life. And I was having a a hard time enjoying the work I was doing. God had called me to preach when I was 15, actually. And I had been able to preach and teach most of my life, um, or at least since that point. But right out of college, I went through like two years there where I had no opportunities to teach or preach or do anything like that, and I, was unha I wasn't happy with my work. Um, I wasn't happy with my job, and I was really frustrated. I kept uh, trying to make something work, so I figured if I, if I don't have opportunities to do teaching or preaching or that kind of thing, maybe I'll just do art, so we tried moving. We lived in Waco at the time. We tried moving to Dallas thinking, well, I can do freelance work in Dallas and there'll be more opportunities there, but there weren't. Um, but uh, Dallas was more expensive than Waco, so there's that. Um, and then um, we got pregnant with Beth and long story short, we ended up back in Waco. Um, but I was really frustrated. It's like, God, I, I want... I want to do something more with my life. This isn't what I want. And I remember being really frustrated and finally coming to a point where I said, you know what, God knows I'm willing. God knows I'm available for whatever he has in mind. So I finally just told God, you know what, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do whenever you want me to do it. And I'll stop trying to make it happen. I'll stop trying to work it all out myself. And you know, uh, the moment I did that was the moment God started opening doors. And before long, I was given opportunity to do ministry. And since then, I have had the opportunity to teach and preach everywhere I've been since that moment. Um, I haven't always been pastor, but I have always had the opportunity to do those things. And what I realized in all of this was that sometimes we have a real set idea in our mind of what our life should be, and we think we're going to work it out, we're going to figure it out, we're going to make it work. And uh, sometimes it doesn't work out the way we expect it to. And we come to God with that question. God, can you make some sense of all of this? Maybe you've experienced some of that in life, where uh, you experience the frustration of trying to do things and making your life be something that you are satisfied with, and it just doesn't seem to work out no matter what you do. That's kind of the story we're looking at today. There was a man who came to Jesus and was very dissatisfied with his life. So we are in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. 
Let me read the first verse here. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's interesting, this story is found in the first three of the four Gospels. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All three of them tell us that this man was very wealthy. But Luke is the one who tells us he was a ruler among his people. And Matthew is the one who tells us that he was young. So you might have heard of the story of the rich young ruler we kind of have to put that together from all three uh, of the gospel accounts. Um, Mark, uh, Mark tells us some interesting details about him, though. He, when he comes to Jesus, it's not just he runs into Jesus, they're out walking, and uh, he comes across Jesus casually one day. Now, this guy comes looking for Jesus, with some degree of desperation, right? He comes running up to Jesus. He doesn't just waltz up. He doesn't say, hey, how's it going? He runs up to Jesus and falls on his knees before Jesus because what he needs to ask Jesus is vitally important to him. It's tremendously important to him. He's desperate. And what he asks him is, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Jesus responds as he often does with probably not what he was expecting. First thing he says is, why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. And this guy had probably said, good teacher, thinking, well, I'll just be polite and nice, and he's a good guy, and he's a good teacher, and I'll just call him that. But Jesus says, stop a minute. Think about what you just called me. You called me good. But that's a term that really only applies to God. Now, notice Jesus doesn't say, don't call me good. Only God is good. That's not what he says. He says, think a minute about what you've just said. Why do you call me good? And he says, only God is good. He's making him think about what he's said and basically affirming that, yes, the, the question you have about insatis you being uns not satisfied with your life and you want to know about eternal living, not just living, but living forever, and that's the promise Jews knew. God had said he was sending the Messiah who would establish the eternal kingdom of God, and those who became part of his kingdom would one day uh, live forever with him in that kingdom. Maybe that's what he's, he's saying. I, I have no sense that I'm in any way connected to any of that. My life just feels mundane, and I'm going through the motions of things, and uh, what do I have to do to get into this next level? And the first thing Jesus says is, wait a minute, you called me good. There's only one person who is good, God. And Jesus doesn't say, don't call me good. Only God is good. He just informs him, the only good person out there is God. All of us, we, we abuse the term good. We, we say, I'm a good person, or that person's a, that's a good person. But really, our, our bar is so low that we, we call good things that are not good. Uh, if we're talking good in the sense nothing at all objectionable about, uh, objectionable about it, then only God is good. And Jesus is kind of letting him know, you know, you've come to the right place. Because he doesn't say, I'm not good. He just says, know who you're talking to. And I actually can do something about what you have come to ask about. If you want to know about your life not being satisfied, if you want to know about that thing within you that calls out to eternity, that calls out to significance, that calls out to true living. When you come to Jesus, you've come to the right place. He is good.
because he is God. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, you must not cheat anyone, honor your father and your mother. Does anybody know where that comes from? Y'all can yell it out. The Ten Commandments, all right, whoever said that, good job. Now, there's only six of those that I just read, right? So, uh, the Ten Commandments, if you're familiar with them at all, what do the first four Ten Commandments have to do with? The first four of the Ten Commandments deal with our relationship with God. Not having other gods before him, not worshiping idols, devoting one day of each week to him exclusively, not taking his name in vain. Jesus doesn't mention any of those. He takes the easy half, the one that has to do with how we treat each other. You might not know this. This is a, a, an interesting little tidbit about history. But historically, Baptists in this country, they were kind of starting out around the time this country was starting. Um, and they insisted they called these the two tablets of the law. The first four commandments, the idea being the first four, you know how God gave Moses two tablets with the Ten Commandments. The first tablet being the first four commandments, they have to do with how we relate to God. And the second tablet of the law being the one that deals with how we treat each other. And what the early Baptists insisted, and they were very insistent on this, is that the government should regulate the second tablet of the law. The government should write laws and punish people who think, do things like murder or steal. They should regulate how we treat one another. But they insisted that the first tablet of the law, how we relate to God, that the government should not try to control that. But that every person, I'm going to use a big word, every person has soul competency. So our soul is competent to negotiate a relationship with God personally. We don't need somebody else to handle that for us. We are each able to make the decision or not to have a relationship of trust with God or not. But they said the government shouldn't get in that. It should only focus on how we treat one another and write laws about that. Now I say that because I think in recent years, uh, some, some of our Baptist brothers have strayed a little bit from that ideal, but uh, I think it was a great uh, thing for, for government to begin to let people to have their own relationship with God on their own terms rather than somehow mediated by the government. So Jesus tells them to focus on the second tablet of the law, the one that focuses on how we treat one another. And he lists uh, these commandments, the, the six. Uh, there's one that he's kind of rephrased, the one about not coveting. He says, don't defraud. Uh, but these are commandments about how we treat one another and treating one another in a, in a loving way. And now the man responds, teacher. The man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. I think the guy's disappointed with Jesus because his answer kind of sounds like he's saying, Jesus, you didn't tell me anything I didn't already know. In fact, you told me something I've known since I was in Sunday school. Since I was a kid. Now, he's young. He's not an old man. But see, since I was <coughs> much younger than I am now, I've known all about these commandments. My parents taught them to me. And I have been keeping them. I have been doing all this stuff, and here's the problem. It didn't work. I'm still not really, I don't have this interior sense that I'm really living. It's just not working. And the answer you've given me is no help at all, Jesus, because I've already tried all that and it didn't work. And maybe you've had some experience similar to that. You've done the whole religion thing. 
You've tried being a good person and you've focused on all these commandments and all the rules of what you should do or shouldn't do and treating other people the right way. And even, even when you succeed in doing these things, it still doesn't feel right. There's something still missing. You're, you're, you have no sense that uh, you've satisfied what your soul was looking for. And that's where this rich young ruler finds himself. Now I want you to notice about him. This is a guy that should be happy, right? What is he lacking? He's a ruler, so he's well respected. He enjoys the respect of his community. People like him, they're not hating on him, they're not uh, dismissing him or treating him badly. He's very wealthy, we're told, later in the story. So he has everything he needs. And he's also a great guy. He's got all the kind of uh, behavioral things you would expect that would make a person feel good about themselves. They're treating people, <coughs> he's treating people around him right. And he's doing what the religious li experts tell him he should be doing. He's doing everything. And yet, it's not working. I don't know if you've found yourself there where uh, you've, you start chasing after something in life thinking, you know, I'm not happy now, but when I get this thing, then, then I'll be happy. I'm not happy now, but when I uh, get this boyfriend or this girlfriend, then I'll be happy. I'm not happy now, but when we get married, I'll be happy. I'm not happy now, but when we have children, I'll be happy. I'm not happy now, but when my career works out, I'll be happy. And it doesn't work. And sometimes in desperation, we turn to religious things, thinking, okay, well, let's, let's focus on more important things, and maybe by being a spiritually great person, it'll all work out. And it doesn't. We still have the same sense of emptiness in our lives. That's exactly where this guy finds himself. And Mark tells us something very interesting. He tells us something none of the other gospel writers mention. He talks about Jesus' own thoughts about him and how Jesus uh, relates to him before he tells us how Jesus continues in his response. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. That's such an interesting moment that Mark tells us here. It's like Jesus turns and stops a moment. It's like the whole narrative takes a pause, and we are allowed to notice this moment where Jesus fixes his eyes on the man who's come and knelt before him with this desperate need. <clears throat> Jesus looks at him, and he loves him. He loves him. That's important because you might think, when we keep reading here, that Jesus kind of doesn't like him, or that he's trying to prove some kind of point that he's not as good as he thinks he is. But that's not where Jesus is coming from. What Jesus has to say to him he is saying because he loves this guy. Because he wants what is absolutely best for him. So what does he say? There is still one thing you haven't done. Some translations say you still lack one thing. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. You see, Jesus looks at him, loves him, and he says, you know what? I'm not going to play games with you. Sometimes when people came and asked Jesus things and they really weren't looking for the real answer, they just wanted to fight with him about something, 
Jesus would respond with something kind of cryptic. He would tell a parable or something and wouldn't really explain what it meant. Sometimes he would do that, but that's not the way he responds to this man. He doesn't say anything cryptic. He doesn't try to make it difficult for him to understand what he's trying to say. He says it as plainly as he could possibly have said it. There's one thing you're missing. Now, it's also no, interesting to note that he says he's missing one thing, but tells him to do two things. First of all, he says, take all your possessions, sell them, give the money to the poor, and then come follow me. And he does mention, by doing this, you will be investing in heaven. You will be investing in this kingdom you're interested in being a part of. You will be uh, storing up something in a place that it cannot be taken from you. You see, this man's problem was not that he didn't have enough money. It was not that he didn't have good enough friends. It was not that he was not trying hard enough to do the right thing. This man's problem was that his heart was captivated by something that could not deliver what he needed. His heart was captivated by his money. And the instruction Jesus gives him is not an instruction that he gave to every rich person he met, but it is the instruction he gives this man because he knows that this is the problem this man has, that he has allowed his heart to belong to his belongings. And perhaps Jesus knew that, and that's why he didn't mention uh, the first table of the law in the beginning, because he knew that was where his problem resided. I'm sorry. I'm doing the delicate part now. You see, this guy's life was centered on something he didn't realize. He had centered his life on his possessions. And this is what had captivated his life. Now, he had all he needed and more, and he was convinced that this would ultimately result in him being happy. But guess what? He wasn't happy. It hadn't worked at all. So unhappy was he that we find him here running up to Jesus, falling at his feet, and begging him to give him the answer. Tell me what it is that I'm missing here because I should have it all. I should be happy. It should be working, and it's not. So what do I need to do? And that's why Jesus says there's really only one thing you need to do. You need to replace your God. You need a different God in your life. You need a different God over your heart. And the way to deal with it definitively is get rid of that God. Deliver it over. Hand it over and 
Uh, Jesus doesn't just say, lose everything you've got and then you'll be great. He says, get rid of it because I need you to follow me. And you can't uh, be living your life completely given over to these things and also be following after me. He needs a real God in his life, not the God he had been serving. And Jesus gives him the opportunity. Now notice, Jesus is actually offering him exactly what he's looking for. He wants life, he wants his life to mean something. He wants a sense of, my life is what it should be, and I want a sense of satisfaction with my life, and I want to know that my living is meaningful. And not only that, but I want some sense of security that I am part of what God's up to and that eternity is within grasp for me, that my life can be more than just my time here right now, but that I can actually participate in these pro promises we find in Scripture of life everlasting. If only I knew what I'm missing. Jesus tells him exactly what he's missing. He's got religion. He's got money. He's got position and power and respect. What he doesn't have is Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm offering you an invitation. You can come in and be a part of this. You get rid of the other God you've got and I'll be your God. So he isn't just saying get rid of your stuff and just uh, there'll be this great emptiness in your life now. No, he says get rid of this stuff and let me take that place. Let me step into the emptiness left behind when you get rid of the other stuff. And let me become the living that will go on forever in your life. So, how does this story end? Well, sadly, this is a story that does not end well. At this, the man's heart fell. And he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Here's the absolute tragedy of this. The reason this guy wouldn't follow Jesus is he wasn't willing to have Jesus be all he needed. He was insistent on keeping the other things he'd been trusting his life to. And because Jesus said, no, the only way I can give you what I want to give you is for you to give that up. I'm not going to take up a small corner in your life. I need to take the whole thing to give you all the life I have to give you. So he walked away. He said, no. What I have is too valuable. Too important to me. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe that's what's kept you from Christ. You know you're holding on to something you think your life depends on. You think your life would not work without this thing, and you're unwilling to surrender that to Christ. You know the tragedy of that? Is that you already know that doesn't work. You're already miserable. You hate your life. You already know it's empty. So what are you holding on to? What are you clinging to? 
This guy knew he was miserable, miserable enough that he runs up to Jesus, falls on his knees before him. Please help me. It's not working. And Jesus gives him the answer. He doesn't even make him do some great thing to earn it. He says, okay, here it is. This is all you need to do. Replace everything else and put me in that spot. And he says, no, it's too valuable. Do you see the irony? If it was so valuable, why were you so miserable? If you already know it doesn't work, what are you holding on to? And there's this sense that somehow Jesus is trying to take from us the most important things in our lives. Today, sometimes people are trying to form this identity for themselves, and sometimes you base it on career. Sometimes you base it on uh, any number of things that you say, this is going to be how I define who I am, uh, the things I own, the things I do, how I uh, present myself to the world around me. This is everything, and I am not willing to surrender that to come to Jesus. And the, 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 the thing that breaks my heart is that the misery you experience without Jesus is never going to go away. No matter what you do, no matter what you accomplish, no matter how deep you dig yourself into this path, it's never going to go away because the one thing you lack is Jesus. And what you need to get Jesus in your life is to say, I'm going to give him all the room. I'm not going to cram Jesus into a corner of my life. I'm going to give him the whole of it. For this man, it meant get rid of your wealth. God doesn't say that to everyone. Uh, but to this man, that was what it meant. If you want to really follow me, we need to deal with this false God right now and get it out of the way, and let's go. I'll take you today. Come now. And he walked away. He said, no, I'd rather hang on to this misery than for you to take my life and make something glorious out of it. I would rather this and die than to know life eternal. Maybe that's you today. I'll tell you, if you walk away from Jesus, there's only one way to walk away from Jesus. It's the way the rich young ruler did. You walk away sad. There is no life apart from him because he is life. He is the author and sustainer and goal of every living being. And apart from him, we will never find it. Jesus, just as he did with the young ruler, loves us. He loves us dearly and deeply. And he wants our lives to be full and meaningful. He invites us to come and follow him. But the cost is, you might ask, what does it cost me to follow Jesus? And the answer is pretty simple. Everything. You surrender it all to him. You give him control of your career, your identity, your relationships, your future, your eternity. You give him everything. And in turn... He gives you all he has to give. The Bible says God holds no good thing back from those who love him. You know how much good stuff God has to give you? It's a lot. It's more than we can comprehend. It's going to take us eternity to unpack it. That's how good he is. And if there's anything holding you back from surrendering to him, let me tell you, you're not losing anything by surrendering everything to him. Because he's giving you much more. So we have a time now. We're going to sing a song. 
Um, and this is a time of response. Children, you can go back to your parents if you'd like. This is a time uh, to respond to the Word of God. And let me tell you, today is unequivocally an invitation from Jesus. And what he's telling you this morning is, I want you to surrender everything you have to me, and I want you to follow me. This week in children's camp, we've been talking about following Jesus. That's exactly what he's inviting you to today. And uh, this is the time, if you have not done this before, I want to challenge you to do this today, to surrender everything. Say, Jesus, take all of my life, and I want all of your life in me. If you're ready to make that great exchange this morning, this is your opportunity to do it. Let's all stand. And while we're singing this song, we'll have people here at the front, if y'all would come down now, uh, people on either side of the stage. Whatever God is putting on your heart this morning, be obedient to his invitation. Come and receive what he's offering you. Come while we sing. Take the hand of, of the person on one side or the other of the stage and let them pray with you. Share with them what God's put on your heart. Come while we sing.